there's one thing that unites humanity. It's everyone's need for love, to find a partner in life. The advent of the Internet opened a whole bunch of ways to meet people. One aspect of Internet dating that has taken off in recent years is Eastern women looking for Western men. Monica Liu is a sociologist at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. Born in China, she moved to the U.S. at the age of eight. She recently had the opportunity to study why so many mature Chinese women were on the hunt for love across many borders. The main reason, I would say, is age. That I think it's the biggest thing because the majority of the women in my study are middle-aged and they have previously been divorced. So many of them struggle on the Chinese marriage markets because they feel that there's a lot of age discrimination in China against middle-aged women, particularly divorced women. She's here to talk about the West for love. I'm Steve Fisher, and this is Life Slices. We're going to start with a simple question, I hope, for you. Give us a sociological assessment of Monica Liu. I am a 1.5 generation immigrant. That's a sociological terminology. And that just means that I immigrated to the United States, or it, for that matter, any kind of immigration that takes place in a person between the ages of 5 and 12. So the idea is that first-generation immigrant means that you immigrate to a country after the age of 18, and the assumption is that a lot of your worldviews have already been shaped from your ascending country. And then people who were born in the U.S. but have parents who immigrated here are then called second-generation immigrants because they're not immigrants themselves, but they grew up in immigrant families. It's assumed that if you immigrated to the U.S. between the ages of 5 and 12, then you are mixed in the sense that you retain some characteristics of the ascending country where you grew up, and then you also adopt some characteristics of the receiving country where you're spending much of your life. So it's between that special age range that you really get that mix of both. So it's very much bicultural. And very interestingly, a lot of sociological studies have shown that 1.5 generation immigrants are the most academically successful compared with the second generation and the first generation. And the idea is that they have the language capability and they're acculturated into the new country that they've they're moved to so those skills really help them academically and on the job market but at the same time they still retain some of that immigrant drive compared with someone who's maybe third fourth fifth generation out and their parents have already settled so it's kind of an interesting theory it's a theory so, but it's not proven it's been shown to be true based on some academic studies but that always comes with its own caveats so some research does show that, but I'm sure it, it's not the case in every individual scenario. You are studying, or is this your, you're going for your doctoral currently? Oh, no, no. I am a professor at University of St. Thomas. Okay. So you have a full, a full doctorate. Yeah. I graduated in 2015, so it's actually been quite a few years. How many times have you been back to China since you emigrated? I hadn't visited China between the ages of eight and 18. So the first time I had gone back after moving here was when I got into college. But then, since then, since I graduated from college, I had actually gone back every single year. And I've actually lived in China in 2011 and 2012 when I got a Fulbright scholarship to conduct research. And between, I would say, 2005 and 2019, I had gone back every single year during the summer, sometimes during the winters, until COVID hit. So 2019, I haven't been back there since, but I'm planning on going back next year. What was it like the first time you went back after moving here? Was there a, a culture shock or was it still kind of ingrained in you that you knew what it was like? So there was no surprises. Because it, it had been such a long time span. So I grew up with my grandparents and my father was actually a graduate student in the U.S. and he studied sociology here. He also got a PhD in sociology. So I didn't really know my parents when I was growing up because I had spent all the time being raised by my grandparents. So after I came to the U.S., right, that was very much a culture shock for me. But after having moved here, we didn't have the money and the resources back in the days to go back. So between the ages of eight and eight and 18, I actually spent most of my time communicating with my grandparents through letter writing because we didn't have cell phone technology. It's not like today where you can just hop on Zoom or FaceTime. 
And so the first time I went back after all those years, I had a lot of childhood memories and I was trying to map that on to what I was seeing when I was there. And I felt like there's some disconnect between what I remembered and what I was seeing. Of course, my grandparents didn't feel foreign to me because they had visited me in between those years in the US. But I, my aunts, my cousins, having going back to see my elementary school teacher, going back to the kindergarten I grew up in and all the streets and the houses. Yeah, I couldn't really map them onto my mental image when I had left. I felt like a lot had changed. China had capitalized a lot. But what remained the same was all the family bonds and ties and just feeling like I was back home again with my extended family, the family that raised me. So that felt really good. And it, it felt like that never changed over time. Your web page says she has explored the phenomenon of global internet dating and cross-border marriage between women from China and men from English-speaking Western countries. Why that particular aspect of cross-cultural relationships? What, what attracted you to that? You know, this project kind of fell in my lap by happenstance. I've always been interested in dating, marriage, just those types of issues, and being someone who is from China and has family from China and growing up in the U.S., right, that added facet of the cross-border marriage element and cross-cultural element naturally would interest me, but regarding the specific project, I was in my first year in graduate school and went into the program wanting to study economic sociology because I have a BA in business administration. And during my first semester in grad school, I got a phone call from my dad saying that we have an old family friend. She was wanting to seek out a foreign man and she wanted some advice on dating tips and she asked my father and my father redirected her to me so then I got to know this woman and I thought that a lot of the stories that she was telling me about this agency where she had been meeting Western men were really interesting. So I asked if I could go and check out this place since I was going back to visit my grandparents anyway and she allowed me to do so. And the, the dating agency managers, they happened to turn out to be old friends of my uncle. So they let me go in there and do the research. You recently wrote an article for The Conversation titled, Why Are Some Chinese Women Still Looking to the West for Love? Simply put, why? A number of reasons. And the main reason, I would say, is age that I think it's the biggest thing because the majority of the women in my study are middle-aged and they have previously been divorced. So many of them struggle on the Chinese marriage markets because they feel that there's a lot of age discrimination in China against middle-aged women, particularly divorced women. One, there is a revival of traditional gender ideologies in China that includes the increased emphasis on feminine youth and women's domesticity. A lot of men, especially if they're financially well off, they look to remarry a younger woman. This is obviously a phenomenon that we can see in many different parts of the world, including the US, but it's especially pronounced in China. So a lot of women, especially those that are well off, want to marry a man of similar social economic status, but they're finding that those men are opting for much younger women. Some of the women in my study have been previously married to wealthy men, and some of those men cheated on them with younger women. So they sometimes think that Western men may be more family oriented and more loyal. Now that kind of age discrimination applies not only on the marriage market, but also on the labor market in China as well. In China, as the country becomes a more of a mixed economy with capitalist characteristics in retail and service sectors, a lot of industries are wanting to hire younger women, women under the age of 30. So for example, when I was in my late 20s in China, asking when I went to get a foot massage, I went there and asked if I could potentially work here one day. And I was told that if they asked about my age, I wish to tell them I'm below the age of 25, even though I was not for a foot massage position. So you can see that that kind of age discrimination. And for a lot of the women in my study, especially those who were laid off from factories during the 90s, as those middle-aged women enter the, the job market, because after they were laid off, they no longer had any kind of benefit. It was hard without a college degree. It's hard for them to get new jobs. So many of them right, are trying to get these service 
sector jobs, and they they struggle to get better jobs like the ones in the department stores. And many of them then are pushed into the contingent economy sector, where they are working as possibly nannies or, or other types of temp jobs that don't pay well and don't give them medical benefits and social security. So for those women who also are facing age discrimination on the labor market and struggling financially, especially if they're a single mom, moving west is a way for them to improve their economic condition. And then finally, we have a lot of single moms that really want their kids to get an education in the west because they're finding that the Chinese examination system is really hard on their kids. In China, your Chances of getting into college is all dependent on one college entrance exam that you take at the end of your senior year. So your cumulative GPA in high school, your extracurricular, none of that matters. It's all dependent on this one three-day test that every graduating senior has to take. And many parents find that that's very stressful for the children. And if they don't do well on the exam, then they're out of luck for college. And sometimes even parents feel that because the Chinese labor market is so saturated and and it's so competitive, that even having a degree may not necessarily. Help you get a good job. Sometimes you need those social connections, and for families that are not right at the top of the social economic ladder, they they feel they don't have those networks. So age discrimination in both marriage market, labor market, and desire for kids education. I would so those say those are the three primary reasons for seeking Western men. So it sounds like it's more of a quid pro quo than a search for love. In some ways, in some ways, yes, but isn't? I would argue as a sociologist that that is probably the case in every type of marriage, cross border or not, internet based or not, because in the domestically in the U.S. we still take those. Factors into consideration. It's just a little bit more nuanced and less pronounced. That's very true. That's a frightening light to shine on the subject for those of us who like to believe in traditional love, love at first sight, being swept off your feet, and you know something like Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan in Sleepless in Seattle. It's not quite like that in reality. Actually, I would say no. I, I would say that I have seen couples that are swept in all of that. I've seen people who are traveling to China the first time in their lives. They're meeting the lady for the first time face to face, and they decide to marry on that trip because they feel they've found and met the love of their lives. So I actually do see that in these types of marriages because even if people have. Certain goals in mind that are that are motivating them to join at the agency. That doesn't necessarily mean that when they meet someone who really makes them feel the passion and makes them feel the love, that they don't delve into it with wholeheartedly. Can't you find that in your home country? I would say it's difficult for both the men and the women because they're both looking for a particular type of person that they may not be able to find given their own social economic background and circumstance in their. Country. So, for example, a lot of these men that are in these studies, they tend to be of lower SES. Many of them are truck drivers, small business owners, former agricultural workers who work in industries that have really been in decline in the West in the past forty years, and they don't. Have many opportunities to date, especially if they live in very remote rural areas. For the women, and as we discussed, a lot of these middle-aged divorced women, it's very difficult for them to find men of similar age and social economic status in China as a spouse. So they're wanting to be with someone, and they have certain criteria, but they're not finding. That type of person, they're not desirable to the type of person that they're wanting in their country, and because of the the cross cultural cross border element here, they're actually able to find someone that they feel is better fitting their criteria in a different part of the world. Is there an age range to this? Do you find women of a certain age, men of a certain age, being more of the type of people who would engage in this? Yeah, so these are mostly older women and older men. So the women are usually forty plus. The men are often in their mid forties to the. Sixties, some are even seventy. So, I for both the men and the women, these tend to be second chance marriages for older folks. When you were talking about a lot of these women are divorced in this country, I think the rate isn't something like 
one in two marriages ends up in divorce. Is the divorce rate as high in China, and is there a stigma to it for divorced women? In China, the divorce rate has been ri- has risen dramatically since the 1970s. So in urban areas, it used to be around two percent in 1970. Now that number has gone up to like 35 percent in big cities like Beijing or Shanghai. But I don't think it's as high in rural areas or in smaller urban areas. But certainly the The divorce rate in big cities in China, where a lot of the respondents in my study come from, indeed, it's similar to what it is in the U.S. now. And in terms of stigma, I don't think it's there's as much of a stigma against divorced women as opposed to having children from a previous marriage. But most, given that most Chinese women do have kids after marriage, then there is that. Stigma, but the stigma comes from that baggage of having to support and raise and live with a child, and that baggage can be especially heavy in a place like China, where parents are expected to assist their children, particularly their grown sons, with their mortgages. So, women, particularly women with sons, or even men with sons, so any any kind of parent with a son, they struggle more on the marriage market. I don't think so much it's the divorce, but the Products of the divorce, including the children. To what degree are the stereotypes of Chinese women or Asian women and Western men a part of the allure? I would say that a lot of it is part of the allure, except that in some cases, I think the stereotypes are "quote unquote" real. So let's take an example of the Western men. So this might not be the stereotype of Western men in the Western media, but in the Chinese media, there's sort of two different stereotypes of Western men. One is that is like that Hollywood, the very glamorous image of a wealthy Western man who's very handsome, very cosmopolitan, very well traveled, very rugged, like a movie star type image. And then there's also this family man image, someone who's really loyal, who's very caring, who's like a Nice guy, basically, who so who may not be particularly wealthy, but he is a good husband material. So that stereotype has been circulating in the Chinese media and especially in in a lot of spaces online for a long time. And the dating agencies where I conducted my research, they certainly pick up on that and they promote the Western men to their Chinese. Women that way, and to a certain extent, that stereotype is true. That a lot of the Western men who are coming to these agencies, they've previously experienced failed marriages. Many of them are maybe lower middle class, middle class, or working class, but they are very much loyal and family oriented. And the reason being is that maybe they live in remote areas, they don't have as many options, or they are, or they're not particularly high SES. Because a lot of sociological research shows that. For things like infidelity, we see that we tend to see that within like the upper class and the very bottom, where the middle class, the families and marriages tend to be more stable. So I would say that that image of the loyal, devoted family man is true for many of the Western men that are coming through the agencies. Although the reason may be the social structure of the U.S. and the type of Men that are that is within that social economic strata and and the, some of their goals and their values and pursuits. In terms of the Chinese women, the stereotype of Ch- Asian women in the Western media is obviously someone who's very domesticated, who's more submissive, erotic, exotic. To an extent, there is some truth to that, in that a lot of the women, especially because they're c- coming from China and coming from a time period when the society is changing, in that as I previously said. Gender roles are becoming more traditional. A lot of women really pride and value in their domesticity, and they feel that homemaking and domesticity is a privilege because they grew up during a socialist era in China, where women were forced to work both outside the home and inside the home, so they took on that double burden. So for these women to have the opportunity to move to the West and be able to be a homemaker, maybe for the first time in their lives, they feel that they're empowered. That that's a way to express their femininity. But on the other Other hand, the stereotype that Asians are maybe inexperienced in life and quote unquote innocent—that that 
part. I think it's different in the realities of the women that I've seen and interviewed because a lot of these women have lived through China, where there's a period of turmoil when society is transitioning from socialism to capitalism. So they've gone through a lot of things. Like some women have were multi-millionaires at one point and maybe lost their money. Maybe their ex-husbands went to jail. Some of them were mistresses to. Right, multi-millionaire or politician Chinese male politicians. Some of them really, really struggled on the streets of China, and some have gone through multiple divorces. Some have been domestically abused in China, so they've gone through all kinds of things. So I would say they're very experienced and maybe a little, even a little bit more jaded with life. I was reading the chapter you sent me from your forthcoming book. Is the book? Finished or are you still working on it? Oh, it's out. Oh, it's out. Yeah, that's why why I I sent you the chapter, but I could send you the actual book too if you'd like. So what what's the name of the book so people can actually get it? Seeking Western Men: Email Order Brides Under China's Global Rise. You had a that a chapter you sent me that I read with with the story of Vivian and John. Yes. Obviously not their real names, correct? Right. Can you briefly tell the story of Vivian and John? The basics of it, so that we have a foundation for what I'm going to ask you. Oh, sure. Okay. So Vivian was this woman, a middle class, a professional woman whom I met at the time. She was in her mid thirties, and she had gone through a divorce in China. She didn't have any kids, and after the divorce, she had dated a couple of other men who she met through work because she, at her workplace, she worked. She served as a liaison between businessmen and the government. She had a lot of pursuers, including businessmen that wanted the business, the government connections that she could provide for them. And so, so she she dated a lot of what I would call players in China. Many of them were also married and having affairs with her. So. She really wanted a nice guy, a loyal guy, with whom she could settle down and marry. And so she joined the dating agency, and she met John, this American man who was a small manager. He was also middle class, living in middle United States. So he fit that image, and he really was this nice guy, right? Who would is very loyal. He was very infatuated with Vivian when he met her. He wanted to getting. Engaged with her on the spot, he treated her very kindly. Was very devoted, catered almost to her every whim, doing everything that she wanted. So she was really touched by his sincerity and his willingness to go out of his way for her. He even picked up a side gig to make extra money to buy her all the luxury products that she wanted. But at the same time, she didn't really feel so physically attracted to him because she was used to dating what I call in sociology trans some a man who embodies transnational business masculine. So someone who's cosmopolitan, well traveled, exhibits a certain sense of dominance and power and control. So this fits a lot of the bu- the businessmen that she previously dated, many of whom that cheated on her. And so what, when she was engaged to John, she was really struggling to, during that engagement, thinking, "Should I go through with this person? I'm not super attracted to." And then she met this Chinese businessman named Quan, and he was married at the time, but They started. It started with an affair that was assumed to last until Vivian moved to the U.S. with John, because she the wait for visa takes a long time, like usually months on end. But during that process, she she's finding herself falling in love with Quan, so she wanted Quan to get a divorce, marry her, so then she could break that engagement with John. But Quan expectedly didn't want to. He wanted to be with his wife, so Vivian had to give that up. Move to the U.S. with John, but even after she moved here, she found that she was still not really attracted to her new American husband, and and because she's financially. Doing well off in China, she wasn't doing this for a green card, so she wanted to follow her heart. And if the love wasn't there, she was going to go back. So after a couple months in the U.S., she decided to go back to China and gave up on this married and on this devoted, caring family man because the passion wasn't there for her. My heart is breaking now for poor John. So you had, and does she only go out with men whose names rhyme with John? John and Quan. It's like what other names are out there. But she comes across in your book as quintessential gold digger. She's just in it for the money and for what she can get out of this guy. How many 
people are like that in these dating programs? I wouldn't say that it's the majority. I would say there's some. I would say like it's an archetype, but it's not the majority of the women. I would say most of the women, that this is one observation a lot of the translators made, is that the majority of the women that really are what you would call a gold digger or who have these materialistic goals in mind during their dating, they're the ones that end up not having successful marriages, not going through the marriage or having ending up in a divorce. Because the men usually right on the other side they figure this out over time and so oftentimes the relationship doesn't go through or the marriage doesn't go through and it's or they could end up unhappy and so it's not i would say it i see it but it's definitely not the majority of the women have there been any follow-up studies to determine the success rate of these programs like how many of these women end up in happy relationships i don't have any of those stats beyond the women that i followed which is about 60 i have asked the dating agency managers back in the days and they told me over right the 15 16 years that they had been in business they had over 2000 marriages out of which maybe like less than 20 cases of divorce but of course many people who marry don't necessarily report back to them so they may not know of divorces Monica, we're about out of time, but I think I have about 48 more questions to ask. But I'm going to ask you one to wrap up. Is there any question that I have not asked that you would like to answer? So one question is about the role of the translators and their role in the business, like how they feel about Matt making these matches. Who are the translators? What do they do behind the scenes? That's something I think that was a very, very interesting component of my study. So interestingly, I think the media stereotype of these dating agencies and translators, right, are these money-grubbing businesses that are couples that are trying to look for love. But very interestingly, in my study, I really find that the agency, the company, and the translators were the moral gatekeepers during this whole time. And the reason being, many of these translators are rural to urban migrants, so they screw up in rural areas, they move to urban China for college, and after they graduate with a degree in English, right, this is oftentimes their first job. And it's hard for them to get a job in large companies in China because of that background that they have. And many of them have never had a serious relationship, some have never dated, so they come into this with a lot of what we would think would be innocence. And they're thrown in in these positions where they're translating for these couples. And as we previously discussed, some of these women are, quote unquote, the typical gold diggers. So many translators actually have a very strong sense of morality, and they really struggle in these positions to, for example, help the women hide their affairs with the Western men, or when they're asked by the men, right, to help the men be attractive to the women, even if she feels that the men are taking sexual advantage of the women. So in those kinds of positions, many of these translators, they do their best to not overstep the boundaries that they're confined to in their role as intermediators. But at the same time, they tend to, some, sometimes they would refuse to service certain women or certain men if they feel that those people are infringing on their moral responsibilities. Sometimes they condemn or even criticize their male clients or their female clients if they see something that is unjust or that isn't wrong, that that is wrong. And I think one of the underlying reasons for that, one, right, is that that these people have a strong sense of morality, even though in China today, there's a lot of materialism, and the country is built so much on capitalism, and people are so money oriented, but not everyone is only has money in mind. So that's one thing. And another thing is that the agency's ultimate long term success depends on the actual happy marriages that come out of these arrangements. So if you have people that are just not genuinely into the relationship in into the marriage, in the long run, you're not going to get people coming back into the business. So it helps their with their profit making goals in the long run. I also see a potential for a translator to act as a kind of Cyrano de Bergerac, being the intermediary and trying to help somebody sound more appealing. Yes, a lot of times the translators will help the women appeal. So they try to help the women market themselves to the Western men. So I call this process surrogate dating, where the translators are kind of acting like the women's surrogate. 
benefits. Some of these women who are coming to the agency feel that they've paid a very hefty, expensive membership fee, so they've hired someone to really date for them online. So the translators, because they're younger, they understand Western pop culture, they're more well, well versed with Western culture and ways of speaking and talking. They actually are able to help empower these middle-aged divorced women who don't know how to present themselves to the Western men. I am seeing a whole great romantic movie. For, I, maybe I can sell it to the Hallmark Channel or, or Lifetime because I, I could see somebody falling for the translator when they realize that it's the translator. It's interesting you mention that because the, at the dating agency, the translators are not allowed to wear makeup or dress up when they go with the women to the airport to pick up the men because you don't want to steal the attention away from the women. I have seen some men say that they've fallen in love with the woman, and later they feel they really fall in love with the translator's letters. I'm looking forward to reading your whole book. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> My thanks to Monica Liu for sharing her insights into one side of trans-global mating. As a single senior myself, I can identify with the frustration of not finding a partner close to home and have considered looking elsewhere. But maybe we need to be more open to people around us. You might just find love is right around the corner. If you liked this program, please like Life Slices on social media and subscribe wherever you find fine podcasts. Life Slices is produced by Beatnik Ravens Productions, all rights reserved. Music courtesy of Fesley and Studios. <laughs>